Welcome to the Faith of the Fathers podcast. I'm your host, Carl Gessler. Glad that you could be with me today to reignite the calling of men in the world. I wanted to do this podcast today to uh, talk about something that is kind of uh, ignited controversy on my Telegram channel, The Faith of the Fathers, um, because I've been talking about healing. And, you know, the stuff that I've been talking about is stuff that I wouldn't have agreed with not long ago. Uh, and I've told my wife before, well, my wife certainly agrees, I've told many people that I have like a magnet in me toward things that are controversial. And the reason for that is because I believe in the things that are controversial, we really see, um, we touch on the things that are very, uh, the, the live wires in our soul. And those are the things that we need to touch because those are the things where we find what we truly believe. And many times the reason it's a live wire is because we have a wound there. There's a, um, there's a, something there that causes, uh, that stirs up great passion. And so those are the places where the gospel really comes in to have its full effect because that's the place where we're hurting. That's the place we need to go. If if we find something to be controversial, there's a reason for it. And uh, in that, discovering that reason and digging into that reason, digging into that passion, uh, we discover um, the, the, the thing that we really need to pay attention to. That's, that's the place uh, where truth and lies are having a war. And uh, that's the place where the gospel is going to come in and bring healing. Uh, speaking of healing, that is what we're talking about. Uh, and um, so the, a lot of this sprang, a lot of this, uh, what I started to post on Telegram sprang from uh, a number of things. But this particular passage in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 9 uh, really stuck out to me. After Jesus heals a man who's paralyzed, uh, he says, get up, pick up your bed and go home. In verse 7 of chapter 9, it says, and he got up and went away to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were frightened and praised God for giving authority like this to humans. Um, that is a really profound statement uh, by Jesus, or, or by Matthew, I should say. He doesn't say that the crowds were amazed for giving authority like this to Jesus. Obviously, Jesus does have that authority. But he says he gave this authority to humans, plural, or some translations say to men, which is also plural. It's to mankind. Why? You know, uh, this is this is controversial because uh, most people don't believe that you can be healed today. Many people teach that you cannot, that God stopped healing after the Bible was done being written. Um, but throughout the scriptures, uh, throughout the gospels, Jesus is teaching his disciples and commissioning them, giving them authority and power to heal. Uh, and what really stuck out to me in this uh, chapter is the profound sovereignty uh, or influence. Sovereignty is not the right word. The profound influence that God has given us as human beings over what we see God do in the world. Uh, in other words, a lot of what we see when it comes to miracles and healing and deliverance is according to our faith. That is what's controversial. I'm going to get into that a little bit, but that's what's controversial because when I say, or when anybody says that your healing is dependent upon your faith, well, then we immediately hear, oh, then if I'm sick, then God must be condemning me for not having enough faith. Um, and maybe we don't have enough faith to be healed. And I'd, I'm never going to be someone who says, like, I'm, if I pray for your healing and you're not healed, it's as much my fault as it is your fault. Like my my uh, healing, uh, my faith also plays into whether or not you're healed if I'm praying for you. But fault is really not the word that we need to even be worried about. Um, sickness and uh, sickness and death. It's part of the world as we know it. But of course, Jesus came to change the world as we know it. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us need the grace of God. All of us need uh, need the gospel. So there's nothing to be ashamed of in the sense of saying, like, if I'm sick uh, and I haven't been healed yet, it's it's the same thing as saying, I'm a sinner. I have not been fully sanctified yet. There's no, uh, God doesn't love you any less. He doesn't love me any less. Um, he loves us perfectly. He loves us completely as we are. But he also wants to completely heal us. And so uh, there's no shame 
in saying I'm sick. You know, that there's something wrong. There's something wrong in your body and it can be healed. Jesus has the ability to heal it. Over the past few weeks, I've been emphasizing that over and over again. And I'm preaching to myself because like I said, this is not stuff that I believed uh, long ago. I mean, not too long ago, I didn't believe this. Um, I always believed that God can heal and does heal, but does God want to heal everyone? Well, if you look at the Gospels, Jesus never turned someone away who came to him for healing. That says a lot to me about what God wants to do for us. Another thing that I noticed is that uh, many times Jesus casts out a demon or forgives sin before the healing takes place. God wants to heal us, but there's, we are so much more than physical, uh, material beings. We are body, soul, and spirit. We are, uh, the whole universe has a spiritual element to it. You know, that when God created the heavens and the earth, he created spiritual space and physical space, and they belong together. Um, that's, I've talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but um, the Enlightenment, which is the whole Western world, has been shaped by the Enlightenment and rationalism, separated um, spiritual and physical so that the spiritual realm is kind of the superstitious realm. It's not real. It doesn't really exist. The only thing that really exists are the things that you can touch and feel. Uh, spiritual things are more in your imagination, superstition. They're not real. Another part of our culture, though, uh, is definitely influenced by Platonism. And I even heard Christian pastors give a, a message about how we are Platonists. We are, uh, and, and he thought that was a good thing. But that's not a good thing either. Platonists believe, believe that the spiritual realm is the real realm. And this physical body, this physical world is temporary. Um, it's, it's, it's less than we kind of just, we're trying to get this over with and get to the real world, the spiritualism. That's also very much a Buddhist kind of mindset. Um, and you know, there's a, uh, supposedly Christian hymn, and I'm not saying that I don't think the person who wrote it is a Christian, but it's a mis, uh, conception of what it means to be a Christian. But it says, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. That's not biblical. That's not uh, the the um, worldview of the Bible. You know, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. That's the worldview of the Bible. The worldview of the Bible is the end of Revelation where heaven comes down and is joined to earth. As the uh, hymn, My Father's World, says, Jesus who died will be satisfied and earth and heaven will be one, which is what Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are neither going to prioritize the spiritual realm, nor are we going to prioritize the physical realm. Earth and heaven are meant to be joined together, just like man and woman, just like Christ and his bride, the two become one. And so uh, when we talk about healing, yes, we're talking about physical healing, but we're also talking about emotional healing. We're also talking about spiritual healing, which we call deliverance. So demonic influence in our lives. We all have demonic influence on our lives. Every lie that we believe, and we all believe one or two or several, uh, we believe more than one or two. Um, I can just say that pretty clearly. But whatever lie we believe, that's a demonic influence in our life. When we watch uh, a movie that has some really dark things in it, maybe witchcraft or murder or uh, seduction, these are all satanic influences that can get a, a hold in our heart that can affect us in some way. Traumatic experience, especially if it has to do with rejection or violence or sexuality, all these things um, are footholds that the devil gets into our soul and he begins to wreak havoc by making us, teaching us. No one can really make us do it, but teaching us through profound uh, emotional, uh, sensational experiences to believe lies. We need healing from that. We need deliverance. So when we, when I talk about healing, God does want to heal you. We here in the Western world will are going to automatically in our minds emphasize physical healing, and then when we don't see that, we say so. It must not be true that God wants to heal everybody because we prayed for so and so and they weren't healed. But that's because we have underestimated and not even acknowledged him many times the spiritual healing, the emotional healing that needs to play, take place. Jesus can, uh, cares about it all. 
Um, another part of that is we're say we we lack faith in the love of God. You know, we have we have this wrong idea that faith is about like working up some kind of feeling to try to muscle God into doing something that that we want. That's not faith. Faith is uh, confidence in um, in the love of our Father. And uh, many of us, all of us, to some degree or another, lack faith in God's love for us. So when we hear someone say that God does want to heal you, there's no sickness he doesn't want to heal, and you say, I'm still sick, though. All, as so many of us, what we're, what we're doing with that is we're hearing, I'm sick, therefore I must be condemned by God, therefore I must not be loved by God, and that is wrong. Like, that is not the case. God loves you. Even while we are still sinners, Christ died for us, Paul says in Romans 5.8. So, God, uh, just because you're sick, uh, just because there's still work that God wants to do in your life, doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. He loves you 100%. He cannot love you more. He cannot love you less. He loves you completely. He accepts you. Even while we are sinners, Christ died. Even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You are a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're a child of God. You are um, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. If there's sickness in your life and you haven't yet been healed, then there's no reason for you to say that's because God doesn't love me or, or uh, I must not be good enough for healing. It doesn't work like that. Um, pain is something that is a gift of God. Pain is a sensation in our body that lets us know that there's something wrong. It lets us know that the stove is hot. Uh, and if you keep laying your hand on it, your hand is not going to be able to be used anymore. So there's pain there that says, get your hand off. Sickness is the same thing. It says that there is something wrong here that needs to be addressed. And it's not always something necessarily that is like uh, something we initiated. It could be that someone did something to us. They hurt us. They wounded us in some way. And that wound was left open and an infection got in. And unless that wound gets, uh, unless it gets healed before infection gets in, or unless it gets cleaned out and then healed, you know, we're going to be sick. Um, so God wants to heal us. And there's no, if you're sick today, and we all are in some form, you know, spiritual sickness, emotional sickness, there is sickness in our lives. There's no need to be ashamed. God loves you. There's no reason to be condemned. God God accepts you. He died for you already. That's a, that's a done deal. That is not uh, debatable. It's not, um, there's no reason to question that. Jesus died for you while you were still a sinner. He died for me while I was still a sinner. He loves me. He loves you. Let that be settled. If there's sickness in your life, let it be a signpost that God wants to do more in your life to heal you. He wants to do more to set you free. That sickness is pointing to something that God wants to touch and we can get there. Um, so when Jesus heals this man who is paralyzed, uh, first he says to him, before he heals him, he says, your sins are forgiven. And the crowd say, who can, who can say, who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus says, well, what do you think is easier to say? That your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk? Uh, and obviously it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's no evidence uh, you, you know, that's an emotional experience, a process, and yet, watch, it, it manifests itself in a physical way. Now, he says to the paralyzed man, get up. He's no longer paralyzed. His sins are forgiven. And he begins to walk. He believes it. And he begins to walk. And it says that the crowds were surprised. They were amazed. They were in awe or they were frightened, which I think both are appropriate. We stand in awe. And I think when we, you know, just judging by the conversations we've had on Telegram, there's also this frightening effect to it, um, which as I've been articulating or trying to, that, you know, that fear of if other people are healed and I'm not, maybe there's something wrong with me. You know, there's, there is something that happens when the power of God shows up that is frightening uh, and yet awe-inspiring at the same time. But it says the crowds were amazed that God had given this authority to humans. And uh, in the very next chapter, Matthew is going to tell us about how Jesus sent out his disciples, giving them a power and authority to heal sickness and to cast out demons. But I wanted to point out to you a profound way that Matthew shows us um, our influence 
in this whole process and how what we believe matters. It's determinative in many ways in what happens to us. So um, in Matthew 8, a centurion comes to Jesus who has a servant who's sick, and he asks Jesus to heal his servant. Jesus says, I will come and I will heal him. And the centurion says, that's not necessary because I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. All you need to do is to say the word and my servant will be healed because I'm a man who has soldiers under me who have to answer to my authority. I know how it works, the centurion says. You just say, I just say the word to my soldiers and they do it. So Jesus, you just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus is amazed at this man's faith, which says to us, we can amaze Jesus with our faith, which I find that amazing. You know, you may say that that's uh, not theologically correct. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Jesus was amazed when he saw this. And uh, he praised the centurion's faith. So now we come to Matthew 9. And uh, in this case, uh, a, an official from the synagogue comes up to Jesus. And he says, it's my daughter. She just died. But he, he articulates how it will happen. He says, if you'll come and lay your hand on her, she'll come back to life. So Jesus agrees to go. And notice that Jesus doesn't say, hey, you know, I can do this remotely. Um, I don't know if you heard what happened with the centurion, but I just, uh, I just said the word. So why don't we save some time? You know, uh, let me just say the word and your servant will be healed. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus does exactly what this man articulates. He says, if you, the man said, if you come and lay your hand on her, she'll be raised to life. Jesus says, okay. So he goes to do what the man believed he would do on his way there. A woman who has had bleeding for years and years, and as uh, Luke says, she spent all that she had on doctors uh, and was not healed. She sees Jesus passing in the crowd, and he, she says, uh, she said to herself, this is how Matthew puts it, she said to herself, if I can only touch his coat, I will be rescued. And she reached out and touched his cloak. In Mark's parallel, telling of this story, uh, Jesus is surprised. He says, who touched me? Uh, and, and so he's looking around in the crowd. He says, I know power came out for me. So that says that Jesus, it was not in his mind to heal this woman. It wasn't his idea on how she would be healed. This woman said, if I reach out and touch his garment, I will be healed. That's what she believed Jesus would do. You know, we say all the time, all, with God, all things are possible. But we don't, uh, we, we need to make a distinction. We know that in theory, but what do we think is p probable with God? There's a difference between what we think is possible and what we think is probable. In this case, this woman believed that if she tr trusted, if she touched Jesus' garment, she would be healed. She thought that was at the very least possible or probable. She did it and she was healed. The amazing thing is that Jesus himself is surprised by what happened. Uh, and it worked. And when Jesus turns, when he finds the woman, he says to her, cheer up, daughter, your faith has made you well. Your confidence in me, your belief in me, he's saying, is what made you well. That's a profound influence. And then he continues on to do what this uh, synagogue official asked him to do. He went up to this little girl who had died and touched her and said, little girl, get up. He did what the man had faith for Jesus to do. This is challenging to me. I have prayed for healing. Um, I've seen some people healed, uh, but I've also been sick myself. You know, I don't like getting colds. I don't like getting stomach bugs. I don't like getting any kind of sickness. Um, I've been healed from those things too. Uh, I still get sick and I don't always know why. And that's fine. The love of God for me has not changed because I'm sick. You know, my dad, is, was one of the most godly men that I think I will ever know. He's the most godly man that I uh, know of personally, at least from my perspective. And yet he died of heart disease. Um, why? You know, w he wasn't being punished by God. But I do believe that there could be some things in his life that led to that heart disease, and one being anxiety. My dad, uh, you know, had 12 kids. He painted houses for a living. He had a lot of reasons to be anxious. He 
uh, saw the way the world is going, just as we see it now, and he was anxious about that. At one time, he nearly had a nervous breakdown. He was really in the process of a nervous breakdown because he was he read My Kampf and he read uh, things about World War II and, and today that were just dark, and he was uh, just reading for the education of it, but it made him see the world in a very dark way. He saw the future in a dark way, and the worries and cares of the world were choking the life out of him. That's what Jesus warned us about. He had people come lay hands on him, pray for him. He was delivered from that. Uh, yet there may have been further deliverance that my dad might have needed. And I can see that now. You know, like I look back, I remember the night he died. Um, I remember driving to the hospital and I had a lot of peace and I didn't feel led to pray for resurrection at that time. I felt I felt, and uh, you know, I know this is conflicts with what I'm saying even on this podcast, but I felt at that time that this was God's timing. I don't know what to make of that because I had peace about that, you know. Um, and maybe that was simply because I knew who I was and what I needed to do at that moment. So I had peace about um, where the position I was in at that moment when my dad died. Um, and maybe that's maybe there's some selfishness in that perspective because my younger siblings and certainly my mom have suffered in in tremendous ways. There have been, uh, you know, the loss of my dad is still a wound. I think that many of them um, are suffering from today and need healing. Um, so I don't believe it was the will of my of God for my dad to die at the age of 49. That's not really a, a full life lived. You know, there's. I think there is a time to die. Obviously, there is a time to die. Um, I think there's also a time where we agree that it's time to die. Like we agree in our spirits. So it's like I lived a full life. Um, you know, my kids are um, taken care of. I'm ready to go and to my rest to be with Jesus. That you know, from the beginning, uh, the world was made with uh, with fruit and seed. So there's there was planting time. There was harvest time. Seed has to die in the earth in order for it to bear fruit. There is a time to die, but I don't think 49 is it. You know, especially when you have, um, he, my younger sister was three at the time and she needed my dad in her life. So here I am, I'm uh, turning 40. And, you know, if I was to die at the same age as my dad, that means I only have nine years left. And so I want to be in tune to what's going on in my soul, in my spirit, um, in my life, that uh, if there's anything that causes heart disease, uh, a satanic influence of um, anxiety, or maybe it's something else, I don't know. I want to be aware of that. And I'm seeking to walk in as much wholeness as I can at this point. In the presence of God, there is no sickness. There's no healing. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no sickness. There's no pain. Um, you know, one day you will be completely healed when you stand in the presence of God. But the whole point of the Holy Spirit coming is that the presence of God comes to meet us right where we are right now. There is no healing that is not available to us, just like there's no deliverance from sin that's not available to us. But we may struggle with sin um, because the roots of maybe our pornographic addiction, the roots of our insecurities, the roots of our anger may be very deep and may be layered like an onion. You know, you have to pull off one part and you're like, okay, I got some freedom. I got some freedom, but there's more and there's more. That's true with physical healing. We have, sometimes, uh, especially when our our disease or our sickness is related, our injury is related to um, some kind of trauma, we might need to get healing for part of it here and part of it there. And and we begin to get freedom gradually. Uh, but um, it, all the freedom that we need is available, but it takes time to get there. In the meantime, we're loved by God. Let me just remind us of that. We're loved by God. We are walking in His grace. We're living in His grace. But we should not allow knowing that we're loved by him and knowing that we're walking in his grace to make us complacent and say, I'm holy enough, I'm sanctified enough, or I'm healed enough. There's more. Why would we limit? Why would we limit the goodness of God? He wants to do so much more. In this case, you know, um, there's a sense in which the maybe the, uh, the synagogue official didn't even think that, oh, you know, Jesus could heal remotely. 
for him, and I would understand this, it would there would be a lot more comfort in saying, Jesus, I want you to come. I want you to put your hands on my dead daughter because I really want her to come back to life. And I just don't know that you being far away and just saying the word is enough. You know, that's called uh, a lack of faith because <laughs> I have a lack of faith. That's fine. Jesus is gracious. He meets us where we're at. This man did have faith enough to come to Jesus and say, if you will come and lay your hands on her, she will live. That's what he really believed. And that's what Jesus responded to. The woman reaching out for the hem of his garment believed that if she touched his garment, she would be healed. Jesus didn't tell her that. She just believed it. And it was done according to her faith. The one area in my life where I think I have seen this uh, kind of authority working firsthand, which I wasn't, I didn't think of it quite in that way, um, is just in the fact that my family, I've traveled with my family to every state in the United States of America, except Hawaii at this point. So 49 states over 13 years, something like that. Uh, And we have always gone um, without knowing financially how we would do it. We did it, uh, you know, I, I haven't had a traditional job Uh, with a traditional paycheck in over three years. Um, I believe that no matter what, if we would go out and not bail ourselves out with credit cards, not panic, just, uh, you know, stick to, um, stick to our game plan. We're going to go on faith. We're going to trust God to meet our needs. And when the going gets tough, we're going to hang on and he's going to come through for us. That's what I believed. And we have seen it. There are times where my faith was barely hanging on by a thread. It was white knuckled faith. And there was one time when I, uh, on our way to Alaska, where we were, I'm flying with my family. We spent every dollar that we had to get on the plane. We're going to land at 1030 at night. And I'm not sure if we'll have a car or a place to stay. And we don't have any money when we land. Uh, And at that point, I did get a little panicky. I called my friend um, and just let him know. uh, Well, I called a couple people and just let him know, you know, I, I'm a nervous wreck, you know, uh, and, and God came through, you know, uh, he was gracious to me. But other than that moment, uh, we have never called, uh, when we were in trouble, we, we went to prayer and we, we did this, um, as George Mueller modeled it, who is, uh, if you don't know who George Mueller was, he was a man who, uh, took care of many hundreds of orphans and never asked a single person for a dime. He completely relied on prayer and trusting in the Lord. And this, the whole reason he did it, it was a great thing he did for the orphans, but really his goal was to show his parishioners that God answers prayer. And he was doing that through an example. So that's what I followed. I believe that would happen and it has been true. God has come through for us every time. And I believe that it is according to my faith. You know, people have said to me, I wish I could afford to travel the country. And, you know, I'm always laughing to myself at that because... (laughs) <laughs> we never could afford it uh, in on, on paper. We could afford it, though, because our Heavenly Father is with us. He's rich. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He said, ask and you will receive. And so we did that. Um, so the question is, what what do you believe God wants to do in your life? You know, if you don't believe that God wants to heal you, you're not going to get healed Um at least not by your own faith. Someone else who has more faith than you may come and pray for you, and by God's grace, you'll be healed anyway. Uh, And that's a great thing. That's a great gift. If you have faith to see people healed and you exercise it for their benefit, that's a great thing. One of the really damaging things in the ministry of healing has been uh, people praying for someone to be healed, and when they're not healed, the person praying for them blames the person that they're praying for for not having uh, and of faith, which, which in reality, um, that is, that's very damaging and should never be done. Um, and, uh, that's not serving, uh, the person that's not gracious. And many times it's the person praying who has just a, a, as much of a lack of faith than the person being prayed for. So I don't support that in any way, shape or form. And it's one of the reasons that I opposed this kind of teaching in the past because I saw that happen. I remember being at an event uh, where a man from India who supposedly had seen many, many people healed in India came and he was going to have a healing event. Uh, He told this man, an an old man in a wheelchair to get up and he was very loud and, you know, um, 
Then he said, everyone praise God for his healing. And the man, everyone was clapping and the man was walking around, obviously not healed. He fell back into his wheelchair. It was very pathetic and very painful uh, to watch. But it was, it was kind of like that, tr trying to twist God's arm. Um, it, I just think it was misguided. I don't think that the person was malicious who was leading that meeting. I think he had seen things in India that he expected to see here in America, but it's a different culture. And... If it is according to our faith, which is what Jesus says, then our culture has its unique way of processing uh, what it means to have faith in Jesus. Excuse me. So we can cultivate faith by practice. And um, I would have thought this was ridiculous before. Now I think it's great advice. But um, when we're praying for healing, I think an important question to ask is, what do I think is easy for God to do? Because that's what you have faith to see. Is, is it easy for God to heal a headache? Yeah, I think that's pretty easy. So if someone has a headache, uh, you know, pray for their healing um, and uh, proclaim their healing, command their he command the healing. You're not, one of the things about this too, is we're not commanding God to do something. We're commanding th the, the sickness over which we have the authority of Jesus to come into line with the will of God. That's what we're doing. We're exercising Jesus's authority granted to us over the sickness. We're not commanding God to do anything. We're commanding the sickness to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. That is a very important element of all of this. So um, that's about all I'm going to say today. I just, uh, you know, we've been going back and forth on Telegram, been typing a lot, um, and I just thought it might be easier to to say it uh, in a kind of a monologue like this than to type a bunch of individual notes. So hopefully it's been helpful. Um, thank you for listening to the podcast. I'd love to hear your feedback. And if you are listening to this or watching it and you're not part of our Telegram channel, I encourage you to check it out. Great conversation going on there. Also, my wife and I and our kids plan to do another ministry tour uh, later this year. And we'll be using um, reaching out to uh, people through the Telegram channel so that we can connect with you as we seek revival in our country and reigniting the calling of men in the world. So um, I encourage you to check that out. Links are below, as always, in the show notes. And uh, I will look forward to being with you again soon. God bless.